FM. Hello there, good evening. Welcome to Star 103.5 FM. This is Star Today. Stay with us. And coming up this evening, Democracy Hub leader, convener, uh, Ralph William and nine others remanded for two weeks in police custody after appearing in court today. We'll hear from some of the protesters who are accusing the police of infringing on their human rights by unlawfully detaining them without food and water for more than 48 hours. 48 hours, no food, no water. 48 hours, over 48 hours. No cause. Y'all should be proud. These people are ridiculous. Emancipate yourself, so. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. I don't know how much. What you saw in Sibri is hard. Also in the bulletin, we'll give you more on this development. Plus, gauge the thoughts of a human rights lawyer who believes the police is acting with impunity. Later in the bulletin, Ghana's foreign assets in danger as Trafigura threatens to seize those in South Africa over the country's failure to honor judgment debt due the company as a result of illegal termination of contract. We'll also tell you how Galamse activities in the backyard of Ghana's first president is threatening a stream which once served as his playground. Breaking, but more than that, if I take you beyond to break, and you are in the western region, so I can tell you that even the worst things you are seeing, the Lemble districts, are the best you are seeing. We'll also hear the thoughts of civil servants in the country who have attributed the Galamse menace to government's interference in the day-to-day -day running of MMDAs. The existing Galamse concerns indicates that if the MDAs and MMDAs were left to perform their tasks, we would not have been where we are. Administered through a decentralized local government structure, are responsible for formalizing and regulating mining activities and ensuring that illegality is exposed and controlled. And on the campaign trail tonight, we sit with Dr. Peter Bwama Otokuno, the NDC's Director of Inter-Party and Civil Society Relations. We've got details of these and more coming up shortly. Stay with us. Star News is coming to you live on Ultimate 106.9 FM in Kumase, Empire 102.7 FM in Takrade, Cool 103.5 FM in Ho, Ridge and Might FM in Tamale, Sungali FM in Wa, My Star Radio in the USA. Also live on Facebook on Star 103.5 FM and on starfm.com.gh around the world. This is Star 103.5 FM. Thank you so much for staying on with us here on Star Today on Star 103.5 FM. We're also streaming live on Facebook at Star 103.5 FM. So do get interactive with us uh, on Facebook and also on X as we bring you the live stream. My name is Joshua. Mensa. Let's settle for the details. And tonight, we're starting from the courts because the second court in Accra, presided over by his Anna, Kwabna Obri Yaboa, has remanded the convener of Fix the Country Movement, Ralph Williams, and nine others into police custody for two weeks until October 8. Now, this was after the court refused an oral application for bail by the defense lawyers. The court, in its ruling, said the defense lawyers can come with formal bail applications at the next court. Court dates. Now, the accused have all pleaded not guilty to six counts of conspiracy and lawful assembly, causing unlawful damage, offensive conduct conducive to the breach of peace, assaults on public officers, and defacement of public notice. Now, let's speak to EIB legal affairs correspondent Mutala Inusa. He's been monitoring this development in court all day and he has joined me via the phone lines to give us further details on the matter. So, Mutala, we know there were three batches. As it stands now, what can you tell us? You, we, we know that the first batch have seen their fate remanded into custody for two weeks. Tell us more. Well, Joshua, if you put all of them together, they are into four groups, four batches. 
and a total in 40 accused persons. In fact, in respect of the three who are in the three badges, they all appear before uh, his honor, Mr. Kwabena Obi Yebua of the Criminal Air of the Circuit Court 6. What it is clear is that the first batch of 10, including Ralph Williams, they have all pleaded not guilty to six counts, including unlawful assembly and also offensive conduct to the breach of peace. In fact, the lawyer's plea for them to be uh, granted bail has refused. What the court said was that it ought to come formally. So they have been remanded for the next two weeks. The second set of nine, all of them also pleaded not guilty virtually to the same count, five of them, except that the account did not include the facing of public notice. They also, the court remanded them into police custody for the next two weeks. What the court had was that prosecution is to ensure that they give them the necessary facility for their well-being because their lawyers complain of the fact that they were being beaten, they were being assaulted, the fact that they were having denied access to their family and their lawyers. Well, before I came out to talk to you, in fact, the first asset, including uh, lawyer, uh, for those who remember, I'm a governor who was also involved in one set of eight, were also remanded into police custody. Before I came out to talk to you, the very last of the four badges that have come, have, their pleas have not been taken. What their lawyers indicated to the court was the effect that they have only received the charge sheet and they will need time to look at it. So they are praying that the case be adjourned tomorrow. Prosecution, and before I came out to you, the court is considering whether or not to accept that. But their plea, the charges and the counts have been read to them. Six of them, uh, unlawful assembly, conspiracy, defacing of public notice, and also uh, offensive conduct to the breach of freedom, causing unlawful damages. So these are some of the things that they are before. I can also put on record that police officers have must appear in their numbers, heavily armed, to make sure that everything is under control. So that is what is happening. The last batch are currently in Well, Mutala, you mentioned Ralph Williams. You've talked about Felicity Nelson, I'm a governor. But we also know that Nadine Swa was one of the people who were very vocal and also complained bitterly about how things have turned out. Did, did, did she also appear in court today? In respect of the 40 persons who have been arraigned, Nadine Swa's name did not have to appear in the relation to this whole matter. Those who are well known, Felicity Nelson, I'm a governor, and Ralph Williams, they have all appeared here, and the court have listened to them. They have been remanded until October 8th. Mm. And so what was the mood basically in court today? Well, Joshua, in fact, it is a very charged atmosphere here if you come to the court. And I must tell you, very soon, in late, in our late, the subsequent bulletin, we're showing you the videos of how the accused persons were reacted as and when they were being brought to the court and when they were leaving the premises of the court. There's been a lot of noise. At one point in time, even the court building was being shot at a point where people were wondering what is happening. But what I can tell you now is that all these persons, there are 40 of them, they have been arraigned and the court have remanded them. Quite interesting, but conspicuously missing from your submission was the name Oliver Baka Vomawo. Uh, we understand that the police issued a statement that he was arrested. His lawyers have said he was not arrested. He rather uh, appeared before the police. He, he actually reported himself and all of that. W what is the status of his uh, prosecution, I should say? Well, with the 40 people who were arraigned uh, at the circuit court today, Oliver Baka was missing and guarded, guarded that. Those who were arrested yesterday will be making an appearance to court tomorrow. So hopefully, Oliver Bakavamawa should be in court tomorrow. So, so if, if, from what I gather from what you're telling me, he did not appear in court. So he is definitely still in police custody. Absolutely. But what we do gather is that Oliver Baka is still with the police. And tomorrow, he will be arraigned at the circuit court. As the 30, 40 people made the appearance here, he wasn't part of them. And when I checked with my sources within the police, my understanding is that hopefully tomorrow, Oliver back up from our and the others who were with him who were arrested yesterday will make an appearance. Now, interestingly, we've heard from lawyers of the protesters who were arraigned today. They have raised concerns about the human rights of their clients being trampled upon, uh, no food, no water, among others. Have the lawyers given indication what they are going to do about the decision of the court to further remand their, their clients? You know, what the court indicated was that the oral submission, in fact, 
the prayer for the bail was based on oral submission that were made. The court was clear that if you want bail for your your your, your accused the accused person or your client, you have to come formally for the court to consider that. So, in respect of how they were treated, how their human rights uh, were trampled upon, and all that, the court made a prayer or made a request or directed the prosecution to make sure that the families and then the lawyers of the accused person are allowed access to them for their well-being. They should provide adequate and necessary well-being facilities for them to be able to have their, their, their life and make sure that they are okay in custody. Well, Mutala, thank you so much. We'll leave you to keep monitoring events for us as and when we have new developments. We'll, care, we'll definitely engage you. Mutala Inusa there from the Second Court in Accra giving us updates on the situation with the protesters of the hashtag um, uh, hmm, End Galamse Now as well as reoccupy Julobi House. Now, 40 of them, you're told, have been presented before the court today and have been given remand into police custody for two weeks, after which the court will then <laughs> proceed to make decisions on the way forward. Oliver Bakavomawo, we are picking information that he will be arraigned, God will, until tomorrow. And so we will definitely keep you updated as and when new developments crop up on this particular situation. But let's take a listen to one of the protesters who uh, was arrested. She's a private legal practitioner, Elo Mabibio, also known as Ama Governor. Now, she has slammed the Ghana Police Service for disrespecting their rights while in police custody. Listen to her. To make our parents panic, isn't it? You want to see us in this? You want to see a 26 year old lawyer in this? Because she said, Stop, girl, I'm safe. That's our only crime. Stop the lamp day. Oh, so they grant us bill. 48 hours. Not in a lawyer. 48 hours. No food, no water. 48 hours. Over 48 hours. No food. Over 48 hours. Y'all should be proud. See that? These people are ridiculous. Emancipate yourself, though. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. I don't know how much. So that's Elo Mabibio. She's a private legal practitioner. She was um, uh, also a part of the protest, was arrested and uh, has been presented before the court and uh, also has been remanded into police custody for the next two weeks. Now, she raised these concerns about how their human rights are trampled on in police custody. No food, no water, among others. And one of their lawyers, also Philemon La, he's been also speaking to the issue. And uh, he has also been expressing frustration at police's hand of the protesters who were arrested during the protest. Now listen to him. We do not know for sure how many have been arrested, but we have an estimation, and that estimation is basically based on the report the police themselves have given. Mm. And we estimate that about 40 to 45, maybe about 50 people have been arrested. But that's a number we do not even want to believe because the arrests were arbitrary. The, the, the those arrested have been sent to various police stations across uh, the city of Accra and Tema. Um, the Persons that were picked up are going to be arraigned today. Um, do you have that information as well? Well, that's all we have. But you see, the, the, the problem in all of this is that the police have not been as professional as they should be. The laws are clear. The various case laws and statutes are clear that when you arrest anyone, any accused person, there's a duty on the police to tell the arrested person or the accused person in the language the person understands the reason for the arrest. You must charge the person. You must avail the person to legal representation and counsel. It's tyranny. But as we speak, all attempts by uh, lawyers for all of these protesters to get the police to even indicate to us where the protesters have been sent to, what charges they have been, uh, that what charges have been proffered against them, have, have all been futile. They've all been futile. The police is very non-cooperative. They are being tyrannical. They are trampling upon the rights of the protesters. So, do you know the time these cases will be heard today? Already, we don't know the exact number of people that have been arrested. That's number one. We don't know where exactly the arrested people have been sent. For some of them, we do. A few of them, we know where they are. But for most of them, we do not know which particular police station they have been sent to. And in law, jurisdiction is an important matter. So you heard there, um, uh, Philemon La, he's one of the lawyers for uh, the protesters speaking to Nadi De Tete earlier uh, before these pol the police decided to arraign them uh, before the court today. And so what we do know now is that the 40 who have been arraigned before, uh, who have been arraigned today have been given a two-week 
uh, remand. The court has remanded them into police custody for the next two weeks. And so uh, we'll be following up on this. And I'm sh we'll also be getting some reaction from the lawyers who were in court today on this particular development. This is Star Today here on Star 103.5 FM. Stay with us. Star Today. First, fast and credible. Well, let's do some more stories this evening. And Trafigura Company is pursuing Ghana's assets following the country's failure to pay a judgment debt stemming from the illegal termination of a contract in 2021. Now, the company claims that Ghana's actions violated the agreement, leading to significant financial losses. The situation highlights ongoing tensions between international corporations and sovereign nations regarding contractual obligations and legal disputes. We'll be getting to the phone line shortly to speak speak to Dr. Kwabna Donko, who is a former power minister. Now, he has been raising uh, some concerns from the onset of this particular matter, and he has joined us on the phone lines now. Doc, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you. So, the country has come under another scrutiny. Now, uh, this time around, it's our assets. What do you make of it? Well, when you agree a settlement plan, arising out of both an arbitration decision and a court decision, well, you stand the chance of forfeiting your assets. They, will, they are within their legal right to attach your assets. Um, unfortunately, that is what seems to be happening. But I believe it is not yet too late um, if the government of Ghana shows sufficient good faith, then they can stick to a, a payment plan, and that would then void any attempt at, at attachment. Now, the, the last time this issue came up, we, we heard from the government basically telling us, well, that the country was saved some money when this particular contract was abrogated. And so for many, this comes as a, a rather surprising development. But for you, clearly, it's, it's no surprise at all. But as it stands now, do, do, do you see the government showing commitment to be able to agreeing or fulfilling its part of the contractual bargain, for which reason we would not have these assets confiscated by Trafigura, as stated in this letter? Well, tra Trafigura is still doing business in Ghana, and therefore they also have an interest in a cordial relationship with the Ghanaian state. So it is up to the Ghanaian state to do the minimum required. You've gotten into if I agreed a settlement plan, if I agreed a schedule of payments, and therefore the government of Ghana should honor the payment schedule that they have voluntarily agreed. If there is a difficulty beyond that, you go back to Trafigura, that yes, we agree this, and we our intention is to pay, but because of this and that challenge, we are paying this much. You need to show goodwill. You need to show um, integrity. Once you do that, you can reschedule. So we need to really move in quickly to avert the assets being confiscated by Trafigura as it stands now. Well, they, Trafigura has no power to confiscate, but they can attach the assets. They, have, they can attack the assets because they have a judgment uh, they have a judgment in their favor. And this is not the first settlement attempt they have tried with the Ghanaian government. So somebody in government might show leadership, particularly the Ministry of Finance. Somebody might show leadership. That, look, if we are contracting to pay by installments, let's at least uh, be faithful in the payment of those installments. And because they are still doing business in Ghana, they would want to settle. They would want to have a cordial relationship with the Ghanaian state. That is inevitable. But Ghana must show some concern and must show good faith. 
Mm. And it's quite, it's quite interesting because when you look at the final paragraph of the letter Trafigura issued, they have stated clearly that they would prefer not to take any further enforcement action and instead to resolve the matter amicably by fully executing the settlement agreement as soon as possible. And, and they've given some level of deadline, ideally within this week, and receiving payments in accordance with the agreed schedule. But like you said, someone must show leadership. Now, Talking about the timing of all of this and that, do you really see us being able to show that leadership? Are you optimistic that we can show that leadership that you are saying we would be able to put matters to rest? Well, my hope is that uh, Dr. Amin, the Minister for Finance, um, will take this up, especially having come from a civil society background would appreciate the ramifications of inaction. Right. Doc, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, glad you could make time to speak to us. Thank you so much. Right. So that's Dr. Kwabna Donko. He is a former uh, power minister speaking to us on the Trafigura statement to the finance minister uh, talking about our assets and how they can uh, they would attach our assets if we do not stick to the payment plan. This is Star Today on Star 103.5 FM. Star Today. First, fast and credible. Now, Ghana's cocoa export revenue has slumped for the fifth consecutive quarter, despite the country recording trade surplus for the third consecutive quarter. Now, this is according to latest trade data from the Ghana Statistical Service. Now, the Ghana Statistical Service early today uh, revealed that for the third consecutive quarter, the country raked more from its exports compared to its imports into the country. But despite this positive trend, it is emerging that for the fifth consecutive quarter, Ghana's cocoa revenue revenue has dropped drastically. Here is government statistician Professor Samuel Kobna Enim explaining the figures there. Cocoa beans as one of our major export commodities and look at its export value and year-on-year -year changes um, over time. We continue to see a slowdown in the export value of cocoa beans between the first quarter of 2024 and the, first, and the second quarter of 2024, decreasing by about 4.0 billion Ghana cities as it recorded about 5.1 billion Ghana cities in the first quarter of 2024, decreasing to about 1.1 billion Ghana cities in the second quarter of 2024 leading to a slowdown of about 4.0 billion Ghana cities of cocoa beans export value between the first quarter of 2024 and the second quarter of 2024. From a percentage point of view, for the fifth consecutive quarter, we see a decline in the export value of cocoa beans with a current decline of 26.9% for the second quarter of 2024. We heard government statistician Professor Samuel Kobna Enim. We'll be getting to the phone line shortly to get to speak to the head of trade statistics at the Ghana Statistical Service, Dominic Odum, to help us appreciate the data uh, that we are hearing from the Ghana Statistical Service on our trade when it comes to cocoa. Because what is emerging is that for the fifth consecutive quarter, Ghana's cocoa revenue has dropped drastically. And that's quite interesting because for the third consecutive quarter, we have raked in more from our ex Exports compared to imports. And so we'd like to have some proper appreciation of that comment of those commentary. And we'll raise the government, um, uh, the head of statistics at the Ghana Statistical Service, Dominic Odum, on the matter. But while we're talking about cocoa, why don't you also talk about Galamse, shall we? Because Ga Galamse activities in the Western region are threatening the once beautiful Subreso stream, which was a playground for Ghana's first president. Now, the stream, which is famed for its healing powers, has in the last three has been subjected to pollution by illegal miners who have invaded the beautiful town of Nkrofo, the birthplace of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Now, the activities of the illegal miners has led to the stream almost on the verge of drying up. Member of Parliament for Elembele, Emmanuel Amakofi Boa, describes the development as disheartening, which requires urgent attention. 20th September 2023, I was here with, with the team to visit uh, the Kwame Nkrumah Museum, which is just a few meters away from here. And we had the opportunity to film this river or stream. This stream is called the Subriso. 
This was the stream Nkrumah as a child, uh, while on his mother's back, could feel that the mother had stepped on a uh, fish. And the mother actually looked down and found that she was actually st stepping on fish. Later, this stream became very important to the history of Nkrofo, as people came from all over the world to fetch some of these for healing purposes, as it said. We understand it had some healing powers that people who had problems, for, for infertility problems and other ailments, had to come here to fetch. But as we speak, this is the nature of the stream, 12 months on. The size has shrunk, the turbidity level has become very bad. And the residents here are not excited about it. They tell me something must be done about the situation to revert this stream to its former glory of hope for the residents of Nkrofo. I say, I feel bad. I say, you know, we, you know, we, we, history, galamsi activity, no. Ana ma, you know, we, any other, I say, you know. Galamsi, no dear. I will must say, I have just my best in your munyeska. Best in kuye, I say so fresh card in my. The galamsi, no dear. I buy yanka, you know, I must say, you know, but you must see you. Former president. Professor Evans Tamils and Jerry John Rawlings have been here, as well as other important dignitaries. But the activities of illegal miners has caused the water to reduce in quantity and also the turbidity is very poor. And this is worrying to the Member of Parliament for this area, Honorable Emmanuel Amakofibwa. He describes the situation as a tragedy. This is one of the things that keep me Awake. Listen, what you saw in Subri is heartbreaking, but more than that, if I take you beyond Subri, and you are in the western region, so I can tell you that even the west things you are seeing, the Lembele districts, are the best you are seeing. If you cross the Lembele and go to Avaluijura, and by the time you get to Takwa, you will faint. We basically are committing, committing suicide. Behind us here, as, as the pathway or the, the, the route of the Subrisu River. A few meters away from here is where the illegal miners have uh, taken position and have started their work uh, in g digging out the gold. We'll come back to this story because it is on the back of illegal mining that some people decided to pour onto the streets to protest and also call for urgent attention. Now, we have been joined on the phone lines now by private legal practitioner uh, Martin Kwebu. Council, thank you so much for joining us this evening. So, what would be your initial reaction basically to the developments over the weekend, the protest, the subsequent arrest, and now the courts remanding the 40 who were arrested uh, into police custody for the next two weeks? Good. So my initial comments are that, listen, this whole problem of arresting these 40 of our fellow citizens at the rest has been brought upon us by the police service themselves. They caused all of it. They caused all of it. I say so because, listen, two years ago, we reported Chairman Wun to me to the police, CID board. Madame Fortunando Kofi, and IGP Dampari himself. There were two petitions. I can send you my copy after this interview. Not only me. There were four of us, myself, uh, engineer Ken uh, Ashibe, Kwame Saponetidu, and Adam Sanano. We reported Chairman Wun to me for illegal galamsi in the Tanon Imri Forest, the destruction, etc., to Madame Ando Kofi, that's the CID board. And the same engineer, Kenneth Ashibe, and his media coalition, they also did a similar petition and presented to IG, so two petitions. IG referred their petition to Madame Andokofi. Yet, IG and Madame Andokofi and the lead investigator, Superintendent Inkum, because of politics, they've deliberately with the case and uh, pussyfooting on it. So my point is that if they are taking the wound to me case to court, wound to me who is Ashanti regional uh, chairman of the N MPP, if he was in court, it would have served as a warning to like-minded people. Because when you see the strong and mighty being prosecuted, the small fishes will run away, or call them the small fry. They would run away because they see that, hey, even the big ones have been prosecuted. But they didn't. 
And there are other cases that the police haven't prosecuted. So it's this impunity, culture of impunity that the police has helped President Kufuado to create. That finally led to our citizens, you know, getting angry and going to demonstrate. And then you abuse their rights. I mean, I look at it and I'm like, is this 2024 and ID has led his uh, men to abuse the rights of these people? That, one, you don't allow them to see their lawyers contrary to the constitution. Two, you don't allow them to see their lawyers and uh, their relations contrary to the constitution. Then three, you fail to take them to court within 48 hours. I mean, the Supreme Court has already held that 48 hours is 48 hours. It doesn't matter whether it's a weekend, a, a public holiday, etc. No. That was as far back as 2019. I took that case to court. And afterwards, Chief Justice Eni Yebua came out with modalities. If you arrest somebody and the 48 hours will elapse on the weekend, there is the register you have to go and see, depending on what the offense is and which court. So you have to go and see registrar. I have been to weekend courts and public holiday courts. I've done like five of them. Mm -hmm. So the police had to. Remember Vomawo, when they first arrested Vomawo a few years ago over the e levy matter. The same thing. We kept educating them that, hey, police, hey, police, go, go, go. There's a way you go to the uh, chief justice secretary, you reach the chief justice, they will get registrar. Or you go straight to a registrar because the rules actually say go to the registrar. So it's then for registrar to seek to get the attention of the people in charge of placing cases before judges. And then, so it may never even go to the chief justice. And then, the, the thing will be done. Because chief justice, Eni Yebua, has already put in the protocol. Mm -hmm. Yet, because the police just want to teach these young people where power lies, then they decided to just keep them. It's against the law to keep somebody in custody beyond 48 hours without arraigning the person. Yeah, it doesn't matter what crime. It doesn't. That, this is a, a country of laws. What we've chosen is that the fact that you've seen somebody committing a crime doesn't mean that police can take the law into their own hands and begin to met out punishment even before the court decides. No, that's not our law. Our law is that a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty. Right. So take the case to court. When you win, then the sentence will be meted out accordingly by a judge. But don't say that uh, these are troublesome young men. So you teach them a lesson. No, no, that's not. And, and for you, that's what you're, you're seeing happening in this particular protest and how it's been handled. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just to show you where power lies. Just teach them a lesson. And, and as a human rights lawyer and having heard the concerns by the protesters saying that for these 48 hours that they've been in custody, some of them have been denied food, they've been denied water, among others. How does that make you feel? Yeah, so that. We are a banana republic, you see, a banana republic that the laws don't work, that the laws don't work. Because the Constitution has made it clear that when you arrest a person, hey, the food that you are mentioning, look, I'm telling you, there's a document called service instruction. That is what the police use, service, apart from the Constitution. Of course, the Constitution is the highest law. There's also the... Uh, what do you call it? Service instructions. It's also another document. It's even bigger than the Constitution in fight. That directs the police service how they should go about their rights. It's even the duty of the state, the police, to give the suspects food. Yes, if you take the person to custody, you have to feed him. If you don't want to feed him, grant him bail. So you can't take him into custody and starve him. We are operating as a banana republic. That's I think IGP Dampari has to go. The yeah, RGP Dampare and the CID board, they have to go. Like I said, when we reported this wound to me case two years ago, look, we had pictures. Erasmus Asaridonko did the documentary. You see how Chema Wound me destroyed the panel in Ray Forest. If you had prosecuted that case and the other cases involving big uh, fishes, it would have called a lot of these uh, this demonstrations. There wouldn't have been a need for demonstration in the first place. So locally, like the way we say, the one who brought flies to the house, the one, uh, sorry, the one who brought sugar cane to the house is the one who brought flies. A person who brings sugar cane to the house is the one who invites flies to the house. So I'm laying this at the doorstep of IG Dampare and Madame Andokufi. They should have prosecuted that case. And can you see the chilling effect?
it will have on the uh, small fishes. Because once the big fishes are in trouble, the small fishes, or you call them small fry, they would dis disappear because they are careful. Of course, it cannot be total disappearance, but can you imagine the effect would have had if two years ago we began the prosecution of Chairman Wunchmi and by now we're down with the case. If he is guilty, he will face the law. If he is not, fine. But can you imagine the whole trial? Every day the media would have been covering it like the way you covered election 2012 petition and mm -hmm. then the uh, 2020 petition. Every day they say, hey, Chema won't me, 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 Chema won't me. You know the chilling effect it would have. But because I idea, Madam Ando Kofi, politics, politics, partisan politics, they just want to protect their positions. That's all. So they don't want to touch wound to me. Now you see the trouble has come back. Now it's exposed IG. Weak. Mm. Weak. IG can't do this work. Madam Ando Kofi to the same. They can't do the work. They have to be sacked. Weak. The IGP should be that sacked? Weak. Lawyer, you're saying the IGP should be sacked because he's not able to yes. do his work on this particular yes. issue, among others? Yes, I've already said the Chema won't meet case that he, he, he and Madam Wando Kofi have not sent to the prosecution. And two, this blatant abuse of the rights of the citizens. You know, it, it means that the reason he has to be sacked is that it means that he hasn't trained his men well. So they don't even know what is in their own service instructions. It's a book. So, well, if you finish, send me hi on WhatsApp. I will snap it. I definitely will do that. I definitely will, will do that. But then, um, yes. as, as, as you also... can go and buy a copy and read out. You can go. When you go to the police headquarters, at the back, at the back, they sell books. Some, some of those shops that sell stationery, sell police uniform. Let's say you want to buy service instruction. They will pull out. It's, it's bigger than the Constitution, showing you police rules, how to treat people. Police must give those people food. Police must give them food. Allow relations to see them. Hey, they are a bundle of rights. So remember, this is are not a gift from the government. Giving them food, allow lawyers to see them. Yeah, every human being is born with those rights. The moment you curtail somebody's rights, that you detain the person, those rights, they are not negotiable. Right. So it's not a favor. No. If th these are relatively small crimes, let's say you've destroyed something small, okay, you've blocked a road, blah, blah, those properties are relatively the lives of these are citizens in custody is more precious than those things they've destroyed. So if you think you don't have food in your uh, police cannot afford food, you grant them bail. Well, you as, is, as it bail. stands now, the court has remanded them and uh, we are told that application for bail will be heard at the next agenda, which is in two weeks and all of that. Uh, what would you make of that? No, we don't have to wait for two weeks. Under the law, there is an opportunity to prepare and present a bill application even tomorrow or two days after. So that's what we call abridgment of time. So I'm expecting that, and I'm sure I'll be going to join soon. I've not been particularly strong, uh, a, lot, a lot of energy. That's how come I go to court. I've right. been there with them. So we'll be applying, uh, no, lawyers will be applying to abridge the time for the two weeks, no, to reapply for the bill. Okay. Counsel, thank you so much. And I've sent you high on WhatsApp so that you can send me a copy of that document. But grateful for your time this evening. You're welcome. So that's lawyer Martin Pebu there uh, giving us some updates on the issue. But still talking about the Galamse menace, the Ghana Coalition Against Galamse um, has expressed disappointment over the National House of Chiefs' rejection of a total ban on mining. The coalition in a statement criticized the silence and perceived complicity of some chiefs in the ongoing degradation of natural resources, including water bodies and farmlands. Now, it follows comments by the president of the National House of Chiefs, Ojiahohua Yao Jibi II, who dismissed calls for a blanket ban on all mining activities, advocating instead for stricter regulations to ensure responsible mining. So let's listen to the audio of the president, who emphasized that mining is a significant contributor to Ghana's economy and mm. a total ban would not be in the best interest of the country. We all know I strongly oppose Galamse and actively fight against it, but that doesn't mean Ghanaians should avoid mining altogether. The gold we extract from mining belongs to all of us but there are better and more sustainable ways to obtain it that's why this establishment was created when you submit your application the authorities will guide you to a suitable location for your mining activities 
we urge those calling for a state of emergency and a complete halt or ban on mining to reconsider. Do they understand the economic value mining brings? If we stop mining, our children will lose potential job opportunities. So, rather than banning it, we need to adopt proper regulations to transform illegal mining into legal, sustainable operations. That's what we aim for, continuing mining in an appropriate regulated way. Well, a member of the Ghana Coalition Against Galamse, Daryl Bosu, is not enthused with the comments of the President of the National House of Chiefs and has reiterated their calls for a ban on mining, whether legal or illegal. I think we, we need to be very clear about one thing. None of the organizations or institutions, organized labor, PSOs, media coalition, has asked for a ban on small scale mining. Nobody has asked for that. That was never one of the demands we made. What we said was that, be it uh, mining or not, or whoever is undertaking illegal activities in our rivers, in our streams, and in our places, all of those activities need to be halted immediately. Nowhere did we say ban small-scale mining. And that needs to be very clear. I think any attempt to just misquote us, to make it look like we're asking for a ban small-scale mining, is just to draw the public, the public interest and also sentiment away from what we are been saying. So we don't really agree with them. And that's how we're saying that. But this is very clear. It is obviously not possible to say ban small-scale mining. And that is why we mm. ask for ban on small scale mining. We said anybody doing mining activities. So all forms, activity, all forms of mining should be halted. All forms of mining in our rivers and our forest reserves need to be halted with security effect. That is what we ask. It's different from a ban on small scale mining. I think that is too very And we never said government should ban small scale mining. And this is made very, very clear. Well, still on the issue of small scale mining and uh, illegal mining, rather, let's hear from the Civil and Local Government Staff Association, Clocksag. Now, they have attributed the lingering Galamse menace to government interference in the day to day running of metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies. Now, speaking at the 7th Nathan Anankwao lecture series, the Executive Secretary of Clocksag, Dr. Isaac Bampuado, noted that if MMDCs were allowed to work freely, the menace would have been nipped in the bud. For this year's edition of the Anakwa Annual Lectures and Excellent Awards, that there were varying ideas of political neutrality amongst the Western A review of the situation in Ghana would enlighten us more on the democratic principle and its relevance in our world. Current events have made it clear that neutrality in the civil and local government services is paramount. Even the existing Galamse consents indicate that if the MDAs and MMDAs were left to perform their tasks, we would not have been where we are now. Administered through a decentralized local government structure, are responsible for formalizing and regulating mining activities and ensuring that illegality is exposed and controlled. Thus, the political will to fight and eradicate Galamse must be seen from DCEs and MCEs who can galvanize support from traditional rulers, community members, regulatory agencies to ensure compliance with pollution avoidance mechanisms, prevent mining in environmental sensitive areas, for allocating concessions that are mined in a sustainable manner and reclaim to restore their ecological integrity. It is time for us to evaluate the democracy that has characterized governance under the fourth republic to ascertain whether this type of governance is helping us to develop as a nation. 
So you heard that the executive secretary of clocks are Dr. Isaac Bampo Ado. Let's turn attention to some business stories this evening. And as part of its 15th anniversary, Access Bank Ghana PLC, a leading financial institution in the country, has launched its maiden small and medium enterprises week. The initiative under the theme Thriving Together, Empowering and Celebrating Entrepreneurial Excellence aims to provide industry insights, networking opportunities and tailored banking solutions to enhance the growth and sustainability of SMEs across the country. Addressing the media, Managing Director of Access Bank Ghana PLC, Olumide Olatunji, highlighted the importance of SMEs to the economy. Throughout this celebration, SMEs can look forward to a series of impactful activities designed not only to support their businesses, but also to celebrate their remarkable achievements. Let me walk you through what you can expect. First, management visitations. Our senior management team will personally visit various SMEs to connect with business owners, show our appreciation for their hard work, and gain valuable insights into their business journeys. Next, we'll be offering capacity building workshops. These expert-led sessions will cover crucial aspects of business management, including financial planning, digital transformation, and sustainability. In addition, we are pleased to offer in-branch rewards. For new SME sign-ons, there will be special souvenirs and rewards exclusively available during SME week. It is our way of saying thank you for choosing Access Bank as your trusted banking partner. To further support SMEs, we will be waiving POS setup fees and reducing transaction fees by 20% for the next three months. This initiative is aimed at easing the financial burden on SMEs and making it easier for them to enhance their payment solutions. We are also hosting a networking event where SMEs can connect with peers, exchange ideas, and explore business opportunities. During this event, we will be launching our new new Access Bank business card, which is designed to cater for the everyday financial needs of SME owners. Finally, our market activations will see our team engaging with SMEs directly in key markets, offering tailored solutions, sign-up benefits, and showcasing our range of SME-focused products. This celebration is a reflection of our commitment to empowering SMEs. Together we thrive, and together we will continue to drive entrepreneurial excellence. We love SMEs, and we are dedicated to their growth. So you heard there, Olumide Olatunji, he is the Managing Director of Access Bank Ghana PLC. Now, Group Head for Business Banking at Access Bank Ghana, Kafui Bimpe, shared activities to be marked during the celebration. SMEs have been the driving force behind economic transformations. In Ghana alone, SMEs contribute 70% to our GDP and constitute 92% of businesses. They are not only crucial to local economies, but also play a crucial role in enhancing regional economic stability across Africa by driving innovation and job creation. It is however important that we support their growth by providing them with financial resources and capacity building opportunities. Over the years, we have supported over 200,000 SMEs across the country through financial facilities, advisory services, SME fairs, among other initiatives. Access Bank has impacted over 11 industries, including beverages, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, retail, tourism, technology, amongst many others. Because we value and appreciate SME sector, we have connected them to markets, even outside the shores of Ghana, so that there is a shared impact on the regional level. So you had the Kafui Bimpe, his group head at Access Bank Ghana PLC in charge of business banking. Now it's time to delve into the campaign trail for this evening. And this evening on the campaign trail, I am sitting with the NDC's Director of Inter-Party and Civil Society Relations, 
He's also the party spokesperson when it comes to agriculture. Dr. Peter Buamo Tokuno is my guest this evening. And he has joined me in studio to have a conversation on the campaign trail. Doc, good evening. Good evening. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing great. Yeah, uh, it's been very busy for your party. You've been engaging civil society, also engaging uh, media, all of us to let, let us know your concerns and also to present your evidence uh, to why you are calling for a forensic audit of the voters' register. So why don't we just get into the conversation this evening? I mean, yesterday, that gathering happened at Mikado. Tell us more. Okay, so um, it ought to be busy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the accounts have a saying that your town and bread are well to me, can and have a bread. Mm -hmm. We can't get tired because we need to change this government, this incompetent, corrupt government. And that means that everything that we have to do to make sure that the will of the people prevail, mm -hmm. we have to do so. And that's why yesterday we engaged the civil society organizations. That is just one of one part of the processes to make sure that we have a credible uh, elections on December 7th of 2024. Mm -hmm. And so yesterday, uh, um, is, is, is one significant event, is one significant feat, uh, because we believe that we are in this together. It's a collective mission. It's not an individual mission. It's not the NDC's mission. It is all of us, our mission. But essentially, we need to open up for every other Ghanaian to understand and see things from our perspective. Mm. The, what we are seeing, the work that we have done, nobody has done that work. Even the Electoral Commission themselves were shocked with the revelations that we were able to discover. Mm. And so it means that we have to carry everybody along because if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And so in line with going together, mm -hmm. that is why we congregated uh, various civil society organizations, most labor unions, and we brought faith-based organizations and other identifiable groups to share our revelations uh, that we have discovered with them so that we seek their thoughts and see how we can consolidate a position mm -hmm. to get the Electoral Commission to act and act right. All we are saying is that the Electoral Commission has the obligation and responsibility mm -hmm. to conduct a free and fair elections. But we have seen that the Electoral Commission, their conduct, their behavior mm -hmm. does not pretend a group that is willing to you know, uh, 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 conduct a free and fair elections because they have shown bias every single step. They've shown of bias the every single step? Open, 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 blatant bias every single step of the way. Mm. And because of that, it has heightened our vigilance. We have seen what they did in 2020. And based on that, lessons have been learned. And the lessons are what is keeping us ahead of the Electoral Commission every step of the way. You would recall that from 2023, Every single electoral process from the registration to exhibition to even the district assembly elections, which mm -hmm. was non-partisan, we, we were very keen on the processes, catching the electoral commission every step of the way, from the errors of Coral draw to the numbers and to the registration to exhibition to transfers. Mm -hmm. And the discoveries we have made are staggering this time around. Mm -hmm. We have 74 days to elections. Mm -hmm. We cannot afford, we cannot afford to joke and play and gamble with what the Electoral Commission is doing. And that's why we have been trying to call support from across board, including even the media, mm -hmm. to speak some sense into the, 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 the minds of the, the leaders of the Electoral Commission. They should bear in mind that as a commission, their core principle should be transparency, integrity, and fairness. And, and for you in the NDC, the, N, uh, the EC has not demonstrated these. Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely far from that. They have, they have exhibited gross opaqueness in their activities. They have, they have exhibited low levels of integrity. And they have been absolutely biased in all the processes that is leading up to the elections. And it gets very frightening because when your democracy starts struggling, when people lose confidence in their democracy, then your nation is at the verge of collapse. Your nation is at the verge of decimation, like the others have gone through uh, uh, war and so on and so forth. And that is our fear. Now, all reports, all research reports are indicating that over 60% of the people of this country have no confidence in the Electoral Commission. Mm. That is staggering and that is frightening. And everybody should be worried. Moral society should be worried. Civil society should be worried. Religious society should be worried. Businesses should be worried. Because you can't have an Electoral Commission that is supposed to be the anchor for democracy, which democracy is the only guarantee 
for change of government, for hope in the people. When the people have grown so hopeless and there is no hope for change, there is no hope for any progress, then they resort to any form of mm. violence. Mm. You have seen what has happened some few days ago with the, the, the is it the uh, free, uh, fix the country or yes. the democracy? The hub. democracy hub and then the arrests of the protesters Look, over the weekend. The exhibition of the anger should be a caution to government. The exhibition of that level of anger should be a caution to the Electoral Commission. Because what the gentleman did mm -hmm. on the streets is not a product of any deliberate ploy to just create chaos and nuisance in society. It is hunger and anger. And indeed, those who are very angry and are ready to do anything to restore dignity and integrity into the, the governance of this country are not really those politicians. Mm. They are not those in the political parties. They are neutrals who don't belong to political parties. And those gentlemen do not belong to any political party. And see what they are able to do. So if they are able to do this, you can imagine what political party full soldiers will do if elections are botched, if election processes are rigged. Mm. And so we should all be worried. Right. Electoral commission should be worried. And so what we are doing, we are doing God's work to save our nation. And, and we believe that way. the Electoral Commission must listen. Okay. They must be forced to listen. Bear in mind that the power that the Electoral Commission holds by law, by the Constitution, mm -hmm. is the people's power that the people have subletted small to the government, the president. Mm -hmm. Which president has appointed them and subletted small portion of the small power we have given the president to operate. And so they cannot be bigger than the country. They cannot be bigger than the people. Mm. They are, they are, their views and objectives and expectations are not absolute. And so, what is the case? We have an electoral system. Mm -hmm. This electoral commission came in in 2020. They said that the systems were obsolete. And so they wanted to spend some one billion Ghana CD to build a new system. A robust we resisted system. a robust system mm -hmm. that can stand the test of time. Test of time. Because the register was only four years old. Mm -hmm. And we resisted. But they insisted that they had the best system. So we spent one billion of Ghana's taxpayers' money to put in a system. Which system got members, uh, Ghanaians registered in 2020? Then only in 2023, we started having problems with the system. Then this same system. In 2024, just four years on, is not able to efficiently compile registered people, efficiently compile a composite register for an election. You should be worried. Mm. You should be worried. Now, our revelations, as revealed yesterday, is that there are some 243,000 people mm -hmm. who have been, who they claim have been transferred, who actually do not exist. And we do, not where they, we do not know where they are coming from. And we have requested the Electoral Commission to explain. Remember that we have engaged the Electoral Commission. Mm -hmm. We have given them the data. We have expressed the details and showed them everything. Mm -hmm. And we have requested that from the tools that we used to do the analysis, to do what you may call an audit, mm -hmm. we think that there may be a deeper crisis ahead. There may be a deeper problem that our systems could not observe. Because if the Electoral Commission was not able to observe what we have observed, mm. and that was the register they produced, then we are in trouble. Right. We are in big trouble. Mm. And so what we are saying is that Electoral Commission, we have given you the details of the problems that we have discovered. But because our system was not thorough mm -hmm. and it was not forensic enough, the, the, the information we have provided may just be the surface. So, so for you, there could so, be more so in terms of more. the challenges that currently exactly. afflict the register. Exactly. A so, right. So go in further mm -hmm. and do a forensic audit to discover more of the errors and the irregularities so that we can fix them because we have only 74 days mm. to the elections. By law, CI 126127, the Electoral Commission is supposed to provide a completed register, register. to political parties in 90 days before the elections. We are 74 days to mm -hmm. the elections. Mm -hmm. And we, we have not received the register. So do the forensic audit. Let's quickly correct those errors, mm -hmm. which may be more. But most importantly also, the forensic audit would also audit the systems so that on election day, 
we will not be smiling at the wrong sides of our mouths. And, and interestingly, you hit the streets to make these concerns known to the Electoral Commission. You presented petitions to the Electoral Commission, and you said you want you were waiting to hear from the Commission on these anomalies that you have identified and the calls that you are making for a forensic audit into the voters' register. It's, it's, it's over a week now. Have yeah. you heard from the EC? Absolutely not. Um, what we have heard is flippance of responses, funny commentary, and if you want, comments that are contemptuous of the views of Ghanaians. Which commentary and, have, you, have you heard? You heard that? the deputy uh, commissioner saying that uh, the, 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 the errors that have been seen have been resolved, mm -hmm. and they, they have also come in some instances and said that we should give them all the errors, which errors we are presented to them anyway. You understand? But most importantly, on the issue of forensic audit, we have not heard anything from the Electoral Commission. And so that's why we held the engagement yesterday. yesterday. Mm -hmm. Today, it's almost, five, it's almost 6 p.m. Right. The Electoral Commission has still not responded to our request. And we have indicated that there are so many possible options of mass action that we are going to undertake if the Electoral Commission does not respond. But most importantly also, we don't want our mass action to look like an NDC mass action. We want the mass action to look like a nationalized action, which is very fundamental to the survival of our democracy. Mm. And that's why we have been doing all uh, uh, these conversations around, so that people can follow us and, and share on the same page with us our, 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 our understanding and thinking and why we think that there must be a forensic audit. Mm. And so we would continue right. with but, this advocacy. And I'm sure that you've also heard from the NPP. They have also served notice to the EC that if the EC yields to um, uh, your calls for a forensic audit, they would also hit the streets and demonstrate against the EC. That, that, is, that is one of the most ridiculous... In fact, I don't know what happened to the NPP that they, deteriorate, they have deteriorated to this level. Uh, and uh, when I saw the statement, I remember sharing it uh, with Dr. Omani Buama, and uh, I, I said, I just wrote, this is sad that the MPP has been reduced to this level. I don't know whether there are no elders in the party mm -hmm. or not. We are demanding a forensic audit mm -hmm. to fix a register in an election that you are going to participate. Mm -hmm. If you do not have anything to hide, if you are not in cahoot with the Electoral Commission to rig the election, to steal the election, then what is your problem? If there is a forensic audit, independent forensic audit, to fix the problems in the register, mm. how do you have a problem with that? And how do you intend to hold a demonstration to resist a forensic audit? We are not saying NDC should do the forensic audit. Indeed, we have done our audit, and we have, got, we have exposed some of the errors. Mm -hmm. So what we are saying is that let's get an independent body, independent institution, to conduct the forensic audit mm. into the register and into the systems to help you, the MPP, and us, the NDC. And you see, the funny thing is the duplicity, the hypocrisy that is exhibited by both the Electoral Commission and Madame Jean Mensa of the Ele Ele Electoral Commission. Madame Jean Mensa, oh, sorry, of the MPP mm -hmm. and uh, Madame uh, Jean Mensa of the Electoral Commission. Madame Jean Mensa of the Electoral Commission in 2015 was leading the IEA. She led the charge to demand for a forensic audit of the register. The MPP were in support mm -hmm. for a forensic audit of the register. At the point, we felt that there was no need for a forensic audit of the register. But indeed, when push came to shove, mm -hmm. there was a forensic audit, there was a court ruling, some people were removed, there was re-registration that was done to make the register more credible and strengthened. And so, what is wrong with the position of Jimenza in 2015 mm -hmm. and the fact that she doesn't want any forensic audit now? I think that the media should have a lot of questions to ask the Electoral Commission. What exactly is the reason why the Electoral Commission cannot subject its systems and the register to a forensic audit? Well, what they, exactly they say, is the they say there is no need for that because uh, they have trust in the um, uh, robustness of their system to be able to deal with whatever concerns that you have as a party. So what happened to the trust and the errors and the irregularities, widespread irregularities that we have seen with the register? Mm. What happened to the trust? Mm. What happened to the system? Every step of the way, Every step of the way, their processes have been riddled with unnecessary errors. Unnecessary errors. Mm. Both with the numbers, the accounting, to the extent that they said they use the Cora draw to do statistical work. 
and graphs. You use Coral Draw to do graph. Will you use Coral Draw? Even JSS students will not use Coral Draw to do graphical work. Mm. You understand? And so the incompetence and its attendance irregularities is becoming unbearable. And it's becoming frightening mm -hmm. because it has to do with elections. Mm -hmm. Joshua, mm -hmm. elections is the heart of every society. Every society. And I tell people that even animals go through elections. When you put your animals together, you see that they will start knocking each other, knocking each other. They are doing elections. They are looking <laughs> at the strongest to lead. To lead. Right. And so elections is very crucial. Okay. Elections can be bloody. Mm. Elections everywhere is bloody. Even in 200 years democracy, America, elections is bloody. Mm. So you don't joke with elections. Okay. So what's when the way there forward? are concerns before the elections, mm -hmm. you fix it. The EC has not responded to you. It's past 6 p.m. today. What's the way forward? We are currently uh, 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 reviewing our processes and looking at the next options and would we'll announce them as and when we are ready to announce them. But what we are going to assure you is that we are not reneging. Mm. We are not reneging at but all. But are you disappointed that you've not heard from the EC at all? Well, disappointed would be understatement because we have been disappointed long ago. Over five years ago, we were disappointed. So disappointment would be an understatement. Mm. We are appalled. We are completely appalled mm. by even the delay and, and the nonchalance and the fact that the Electoral Commission are not even giving us a proper response and reason why they cannot conduct the forensic audit. Mm. We are appalled. It's so bizarre that the Electoral Commission cannot tell the people of Ghana that, okay, because of A, B, C, D, when we do the forensic audit, maybe our system will crash or we will we'll, we'll suffer this. We will not be able to do the LS. They have not been able to utter a word. And, and what happens if the EC does not heed the call at all? And so we get to December 7 without a forensic audit of the register in this current state. What would happen? Anything can happen. Anything can happen. And you see, yesterday there was this comment from most, some of our colleagues uh, from the C CSOs mm -hmm. uh, suggesting that, so if the Electoral Commission does not do anything, mm -hmm. uh, what are you going to do? Uh, what is the NDC going to do? And I, I, I got very frightened. I cringed because it's not about the NDC. Mm. This battle is never about the NDC. My brother, when you live here, and you are going to buy fuel, mm -hmm. do you show party card? Mm -mm. You don't show party card. The price you buy fuel is the same price I buy fuel. When you are going to buy Tinky at five CDs, they don't look at your face and say, you, you are MPP, so you buy at three CDs. Or you, you are a Star FM journalist, so you, you buy at three CDs. You buy at five CDs. I buy at five CDs. This is a collective struggle. And we can only deliver results through collectivity. Mm. It is in our collectivity lies our strength. So it is not only the NDC. Mm. Why? The Galamse water, which is causing the demonstration by the, the democracy hub. Is it only affecting democracy hub? It is not only affecting democracy hub. Today, when you were coming, your water, your tap was not flowing. It is Galamse. I have had the same situation three weeks in my home. Water is not flowing. Galamse. Even the borehole are now being infected. It is Galamse. So somebody must speak. Who would speak? Why is it always somebody? Everybody must speak. If everybody doesn't speak right. and it crashes, it crashes on all of us. Okay. If we lose this democracy, Joshua, you will not be here reading the news mm. because you will not even be allowed into your studio. You okay. understand? Very good. Definitely. And so it is our collective responsibility to protect this democracy. And so you have a role to play. Mm. You should be on the Electoral Commission morning, afternoon, evening, trying to seek answers. Whilst we also do our part, so that you do your part, I do my part, he also do their part. Churches, religious uh, bodies, Muslims, and, and labor unions also do their part. Mm -hmm. Collectively, we are able to protect and safeguard our democracy. Well, this is uh, the campaign trail here on Star 103.5 FM. My guest in studio this evening, Dr. Peter Buamo Tokuno, the NDC's Director of Interparty and Civil Society Relations. And of course, he also speaks for the party when it comes to agriculture. 
And so we'll be getting into the subject matter of agriculture and uh, its attendant um, challenges that we are facing now. You talk about Galamse, Doc, before we went for that one, you, you were speaking about Galamse and now the fact that we have people who are uh, on the streets basically telling government, let's end Galamse. And cocoa farmers are also crying uh, with regards to how this is impacting them. I mean, the next NDC administration, if Ghanaians decide to give you the nod, what difference are you going to do in this fight against Galamse, especially because of its impact on agri? Let me start off by giving you some revelations. Mm -hmm. Are you aware that in 2018, Cocoa alone contributed $3.2 billion to the, the ultimate wealth of this country? Mm -hmm. Are you aware that as of last year, in fact, 2017, it was about $2.8 billion. Mm -hmm. As of last year, it contributed only $232 million mm -hmm. to our GDP. Mm -hmm. And this year, we may get only about eight, uh, $180 million right. or less. Mm -hmm. And it has been estimated that this year, our target for cocoa, our cocoa obligation to the international community, we are going to fall short by almost about 350 to 400,000 metric tons. Mm -hmm. The reason is very simple. Because of this Galamse menace and the mismanagement management and the corruption that has engulfed the cocoa management industry. That's mm. all. The mm. cocoa industry. That's all. So it's mismanagement so of the cocoa industry and then Galamse. On corruption the other hand. and Galamse. You see, cocoa thrives on a certain climate. And the climate is provided by the vegetation. And that is why when you look at the agroecological disposition of Ghana, cocoa only thrives in the uh, forest zones, the forest uh, 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 savanna transition zone, mm -hmm. and the rainforest zones. So you have the western region, you have the western region, western north, mm -hmm. the Ashanti region, eastern region, and parts of the Bono region, Bono region yeah. being uh, the main areas that we grow. The cocoa grow. grain areas. And these are areas that the, the gold are also uh, discovered. Now, because of the rampant, you know, illegal mining, galamsey exercise in those areas, the climates in those areas are changing. It has affected the rainfall patterns, and it has affected crop yields, not only cocoa, all other crop yields. All other crop yields. In fact, incidentally, in the forest transition zone and parts of the savanna zone that is able to grow cocoa, they only grow. They also grow tomatoes, right. and that's why we have tomato shortages. Mm -hmm. That's why tomato prices are going up. You understand? Mm -hmm. We are spending four hundred million dollars to import uh, tomatoes, tomatoes every year. Yeah. Four hundred million dollars, and that's how bizarre the situation has become. So cocoa is. We are losing out on cocoa. We are losing out on all the other crops. We are not even getting cassava anymore. Mm -hmm. This year, we are not able to produce maize. We are not able to produce soya bean. We are not able to produce sorghum. So this country is in serious food security crisis. Uh, onions. And, uh, we are uh, even importing so much onions now. Onions. Mm -hmm. we, in fact, we import almost everything, including <laughs> akwele wabi. Do you know akwele wabi? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Pepe. Sito rede. Mm. Akwele wabi. Biane wa importo. We import akwele wabi, which used to be a Ghanaian mainstay. Now, the Chinese people are producing more than us. They took the Akwele Wabi from here, and they are producing. Are you aware that the Chinese are producing cocoa now? Mm -hmm. Very soon, they are going to compete with us on the international stage. Ghana used to be the number one cocoa producer. Now, we are even struggling for some small position somewhere. And so, it's, it's, it's a bigger problem that we need to fix, mm -hmm. and we need to fix it immediately. But you see, what is even striking, though, is that the, cocoa, the, the gold mm -hmm. that we claim to be so important and so, uh, I mean, uh, resourceful, that can contribute so much to the economy. Are you aware that 60 to 65% of this gold is being mined through Galamse and illegal small-scale mining? Mm. 65%. So the entire gold production of Ghana, about 65%, is being mined through these illegal processes and small-scale mining. That leaves about just 35%. Just 35% for the main regularized legal mining. Mm -hmm. And you know the interesting bit. The interesting bit is that out of the 65% of those illegal mining and galamsey and the small-scale mining, the, that 65% contributes less than 2% to the total gold revenue for the country. Is it not frightening? Mm. So 65% of the gold wealth it's being mined through this, but it contributes less than 2% to the gold contribution to the economy. So nobody can say that the gold is even contributing anything positive to the economy. Mm. 
Apart from royalties that these big, big companies are paying and the small shares that we have in there, which contributes that uh, uh, 90%, is pittance. If indeed we have regulated this gold mining regime very well mm. and we have handled the issue of small-scale mining very well, which constitutes that 65%, Ghana should be very wealthy and we should be resourceful enough to even to be reclaiming the lands, to be able to regrow the vegetation. Mm. And so there's a whole policy uh, discrepancy. There is a whole policy decimation, mm. both from the mining sector to the general development policy and the, the, the growth direction of the country. Mm. We are completely lost. Apart from the fact that the mining is destroying the lands and they are not being recovered, and the chemicals are going into our water bodies and we are losing the water bodies and we are not getting water to drink. The most striking part is that our policies also do not allow even domestic greening mm. of our vegetation. And so apart from uh, uh, Sir John willing the Achimota forest to his families forever and they cutting down the trees, people's homes, concrete vegetation is taking over. And so you build a house in Ghana and concrete all over. Mm. Nobody grows grass. Nobody grows trees. You, you believe we need a policy direction? We need a serious climate policy direction. And that is what we have in our manifesto. Mm. But most importantly, let me spend some small time because mm -hmm. of the, the time <laughs> on, on our agro policy and how right. we think that we can fix this menace. Because there's been, been a lot of challenges with food security. There's so much fear. Even the peasant farmers have expressed fear that if the situation persists for the next couple of years, we, we will be in serious Couple crisis. of years, couple of months. Not couple of years. Months. Next year, we are going to have a food security challenge in this country. And as we speak, President Mahama has put a team together mm -hmm. to start rethinking how we can go around the food security challenges that is coming ahead. So t tell me about that it, policy. It, it is huge. Right. Now, in our policy prescription, mm -hmm. we have proposed that we have an agriculture for economic transformation program. Okay. Which program would be an umbrella program to harness the feeding the Ghana program? The feeding the Ghana program will have as its key elements, its key highlights, the, the introduction of the farmer services centers. Now, when we say farmer services centers, mm -hmm. it is a comprehensive, all encompassing center for all farmers. Okay. And so, farmers' major problem has to do with inputs, mm -hmm. access to inputs, the cost of inputs. Now, the access to inputs, there are two types of inputs. There are the fixed inputs and there are the variable, variable inputs. The fixed inputs are land. And so we have to fix the issue of land, which is another big matter which I'll try to address before we leave. Mm -hmm. Then the other aspect is the variable inputs, which is the seed. Mm -hmm. Now, access to the seed, the cost of the seed, the quality of the seed has been one of our biggest problems. As we speak, there is an impending scandal at the Ministry of Agri in respect of seed production and seed supplies, mm. as regards even PFJ1 and PFJ2. And very soon, I'm sure you are going to hear about it. Right. So seed quality, seed access, seed cost has been a problem. So how do we fix these three problems when it comes to seed? Mm -hmm. How do we deal with the issue of agrochemicals, pesticides, weedicides, then fertilizer? How do we deal with them? And so President Mahama is proposing this Pharma Services Center mm -hmm. as a one-stop shop for all these agro-variable inputs where you can go and get the inputs at a lower cost but also at a specialized arrangement where you can pick the inputs, go and use them, and when you farm and you harvest your commodities, those charges will be paid after harvesting. And so now when you want to get a tractor to uh, plow your farm, you will need to pay 500 CDs, between 500 and 450 Ghana CDs. What we are saying is that if these farmer services centers are built in the agro areas, mm -hmm. you can go to the farmer services center and go and order the, the, the tractor the to tractor. come and plow your farm at a subsidized rate, at a very lower rate, for example, maybe 150 CDs or 200 CDs. Then, even if you don't have the 200 CDs, you can pick the tractor to go and work for you. Then the value will be calculated. So that after harvesting, now the deductions can be done from your harvest. So you go for, a, let me pick a typical example. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, Sharif wants to do a farm, a maize farm. And Sharif goes, uh, has about five acres of land. Sharif goes to the farmer services center, procures the, the, the services of the tractor. He is paid 200 Ghana CDs per tractor. So that means 1,000 Ghana CDs to plow. Then he goes there, get the tractor. The land is plowed at no cost at all. 
because the current situation is cash and carry. Mm -hmm. So Sharif is done. Now Sharif is torn between going to borrow money to go and buy seeds and buy fertilizer, buy agrochemicals, and he doesn't have them. The Pharma Services Center has all this uh, uh, agro inputs. So available. Available. Okay. So he picks them, the seeds, mm -hmm. he picks the fertilizer, he picks the agrochemicals, he goes, conduct the farming, then that one is also added to the charge of the tractor. When he's done, he wants a harvester to come and harvest the crops for him. He goes there, he picks the harvester, it comes and he does the harvesting. After the harvesting, Sharif has, has, has yielded maybe 100 bags of maize. And, and, and my sell and go and pay back. Mm -hmm. But even the burden of the selling now is being lifted off Sharif such that at the Pharma Services Center, there is going to be a warehouse which will help you do post-service management so that you don't lose your yields after you have harvested them. Mm -hmm. Then when you have harvested your 100 bags and you go, the, the, the Pharma Services Center now will calculate your debt and say that, okay, your debt is of a value of about five bags of the maize. So they take the five bags of maize without necessarily having to take Taking the cash money from, you. from you. Then, right. when you are ready mm -hmm. to sell, some farmers will want to keep their commodity for dry season or leaner season mm -hmm. so that they can take advantage of higher prices. So when you are willing to sell immediately, there is a Ghana Commodity Exchange which will be modeled alongside or decentralized alongside the Farmer Services Center. At which exchange you can exchange for any other commodity that you want or in some cases even for cash. Mm. But if you are not willing to do that, you can keep it to the time that you want to sell. You have paid your debt and you have your commodity available for you. And how, it, how much it is worth is your profit. So we are providing input solution mm -hmm market solution, an agro-management solution, extension services solution, technical solutions mm. for people to motivate them and incentivize them mm. to go into farming. To go into farming. And we want to drive and, and a, lot, a lot of young people. from the planting for food and jobs? Model. Absolutely different. And I'm sure maybe you don't even know about the, 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 the program implementation arrangements for planting for food and jobs. That's why you're asking this question. Because indeed nobody has the policy. I've been making noise about the planting for food and jobs policy from mm. June 10. And I have seen, since not seen the policy. Even the report for PFJ1, is, is no, it has become cocaine. Right. They said we shouldn't release it, we shouldn't release it. I have followed the ministry. I've gone to the research department. They said it's not available. They, they are still working on it. So there is no policy prescription. Nobody knows what is going on. Mm. If you go to the ministry and you have followed the processes, they have created a platform called GAP, which GAP is now registering farmers. Mm. And even that platform and the registration of the farmers is a problem. There is crisis. And so there is so much confusion and opaqueness around the planting for food and jobs, okay. which cannot be deciphered. But what we believe would solve the problem is the one-stop shop farmer services center. Okay. And when you have dealt with the problem of the inputs, the technical services, then post-service management, and the market, mm. and the business has become more profitable, you will need to look at the other end game, agro-processing. Mm -hmm. So when you have produced the output... How do you process? process? Right. And that is President Mahama's passion. You see, President Mahama has been a farmer. He was born a farmer, and he has been farming for a very long time. So agriculture is something that is very dear to his heart. And so our resetting Ghana agenda is actually heralded by agriculture and agribusiness and okay. agro-industrialization. Right. And so now we are looking at having agro-industrialization enclaves, agro-industrialization zones, where companies and individuals and investors would be incentivized to set up agro-processing plants. We are looking at applying innovation to agro-products so that we can be able to actually meet our food security needs in entirety. Mm. Because the thing about food security is that food security, as you, most of you uh, uh, know, and as it, it has been taught in schools, has four main legs. So affordability accessibility, mm -hmm. availability, and utilization. Utilization is talking about how nutritious the food is, how beneficial the food will be to the human being. Then accessibility is having access to the food as and when you need it. Affordability is being cheap, mm -hmm. and availability is the food being there 
You understand, right. whether produced here or from outside. Right. But the most important leg of food security, which I, is I, recently I discovered, for me. <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is being discovered, is convenience. Right. And so, you know, we used to love Fufu, we used to love our bank, we used to love TZ, we love Mankaya and PCA. But because of the stress we go through to prepare Fufu, it takes three hours to prepare Fufu. Mm, with palm nut soup. With palm nut soup, you understand. Mm. But it takes only five minutes to prepare Indomie. Mm. So you see that in Ghana, everybody eats Indomie. Everybody's eating noodles. We are, yes. <laughs> we are moving away from Kenke. We are moving away from our natural food right. that we consume. Right. And these Indomie and noodles are, are, are processes or are food products that are produced and processed outside the country. Mm. That requires importation. And so Ghana, our food are now becoming imported food. Right. And, and that means that, that means that you are losing your one food sovereignty, mm -hmm. you are losing your food security, and that's why when there's Ukraine-Russia war, you we'll go hungry. And I'm sure that if I leave you, we'll talk for like three hours on our great I actually because... need three hours. <laughs> but before you go, I mean, in a minute, this number, this number has been ringing a lot of bells, and now it looks why, like... Why are you saying this number? Mention the number. Oh, I'm I'm number, eight. number eight. Number eight. You yes. mentioned the eight. Yes. I mean... Why, are, why are you, are, <laughs> have you become the MPP who are I, now afraid to oh, mention no. it? I mean, I'm showing you the number because... Now, do you, know, do, you know, do you know eight is an abomination to the MPP? They don't want to hear it. But they, they said they are breaking the eight. Ah. They, they, have you heard it again in recent times? Um, okay, I've not followed. <laughs> oh, they... <laughs> They, they, they are breaking at 8. They are breaking at 8. Oh, they are breaking, breaking at eight. 8. Oh, this number 8 will be uh -huh. the 8 that will stop the A. Hey. Okay. I, I, I won't pretend to understand. <laughs> oh. It will be the 8 to what? That will stop the A. That will stop the A. Which one but is the, the A? The, the Ghana government right now, the Akufuadu Baumia government, uh -huh. is an A government. Hey. Are you not shocked? Hey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, campaign trail right here on Star today on Star 103.5 FM. And tonight, my guest has been Dr. Peter Boama Otokuno, the NDC's Director of Interparty and Civil Society Relations. He's also spokesperson for the Greek subsector, having a conversation with me on the NDC and Matis Horizon. But that's how we draw the curtains on Star today here on Star 103.5 FM. There's more news for you when you do log on to our news website, starfm.com.gh. I am Joshua Kajo Mensa. Good evening.